Hello, everyone. Welcome to reInvent. Hope you're having a great conference this year. First thing in the morning, hopefully you're supercharged. So let's get uh, how, how your real-time applications can be supercharged using uh, Amazon Elastic Cash. I am Pratibha Surdevra. I'm the GM for Elastic Cash. Joining me in this session is Henry Yang, who's an engineer at Lyft. So what would you expect out of this session? What I want to talk about is what a real-time application means, what characteristics a real-time application is looking for in a data store, and why we think Amazon Elastic Cash fits that bill. We'll talk about uh, some of the internals. I'm pretty excited to walk you guys through the internals of Amazon Elastic Cash, especially around how we get to that extreme performance at scale. Then we'll share some of the use cases, use cases way beyond caching our customers are using Elastic Cash for. We have an exciting migration story that Henry will share with us on how they migrated from a self-managed cluster to Amazon Elastic Cash. From that, I expect you to kind of learn from some of the experience and plan how you want to build out your applications. Then let's walk through some of the features that we've been working on this year. And I'll also give you a sneak peek into what we are thinking of for 2020. We'll have some time for Q&A, but if we run out of time, uh, Henry and me will be available outside the room. Please catch me after this session. Okay, let's start with, I want to, this is a blog from 2018. I want to bring your attention to this blog. This is published by our CTO, Werner. Basically, the gist of this is, we don't believe that one size fits all databases fit anymore. What do we mean by that? There are certain vendors who talk to you about one database for your relational needs, your document needs, your graph needs, your in-memory key value and stuff. But what we believe is you need the right tool for the right job. When you are writing applications, maybe about a few years ago, we, in distributed applications that we were writing, we used to think about how do I fit my applications to the database? How do I actually rewrite some of the code to fit that? I don't think we need to do that anymore. We have so many purpose-built databases. We don't need to rewrite our application for a database. You want to pick the right database that fits your application. What do I mean by that? If you look at the purpose-built databases that we support at AWS, all the way from relational, within relational also, you have a lot of choice all the way from Aurora. You've seen how performant, how cost efficient Aurora is. You still have a choice of using community databases, commercial, DynamoDB for your key value pair, DocumentDB for your documents. Elastic Cache, we'll go into a lot more detail for your key value pair in memory database use cases. Neptune for your graph, a time stream databases, QLDB for your journal, and Elasticsearch. So if you look at it, what I want to leave you guys uh, on this slide is, there are a lot of purpose-built databases. Pick the right tool for the right job. So what do I mean by, uh, how does Elastic Cash fit into this world of databases? Where Elastic Cash fits in is the key value pair. Key value pair where you want to do very fast lookup, quick insertion and extraction of data, and in memory where you have very low latency. These days, milli is becoming micro. I'll walk you through some of the use cases where we are able to hit 350 microseconds for some of your uh, commands that you can execute. Real-time applications, based very low latency, high throughput, high ingestion, low, low retrieval, very high latency, uh, very low latency and high throughput. So what are the common characteristics? What do I mean by real-time applications? What are the common characteristics of some of the real-time applications, right? In general, real-time applications are, these days have millions of concurrent users. The data they're storing is betting to terabytes and petabytes. Usually they're deployed globally. And you see the, we talked about latency. Latency in not milli, but microseconds. You see request rates, we see some of Elastic Lash customers re requests at like about 300 to like 30 to 40 million requests per second. 
the kind of devices that these applications are getting access from are very varied, all the way from mobile to IoT devices. And also one of the key thing is this traffic patterns are very spiky. You want to have your workloads, you want to have your clusters scale in and out without any disruption to your application or changes to your application. And the other model is all this is open with a lot of open APIs. Open because the number of devices that you access this clusters from is varied, and also the, you, you want to leverage all the ecosystem that is built from the open applications for your clients and some of the application code that you're writing. So let's dig into some of the popular engines that are used for in-memory uh, key value pair data stores. Let's start with Redis. Redis is unbelievably fast. Unlike the data, data stores like MongoDB or Cassandra that access data from the disk, Redis is actually accessing data in memory, the main memory of your server, hence it's blazing fast. Open source, uh, Redis is completely open source. Like I was talking about earlier, you can leverage not only the core engine, but all the client code, the application development, the debuggability that happens in the open ecosystem. Very simple. Redis is like single-threaded, very easy code, very easy to extend. That is why it's so fast. That is why it's very simple. You don't have to synchronize data. The cache coherency is extremely high in Redis. The other big thing developers really, really like about Redis is the the amount of data structures it supports. To me, Redis is not just a data store. I look at Redis as like a server of data, data structures, right? As simple as strings to hashes to introduction of streams to bitmaps to hyperlogs to PubSub, you name it. The data structure availability is what all developers really, really love about Redis. You don't have to write complicated applications changing data structures from one type to another. There is a custom built data structure available for each of your types of applications. I'll walk through some of those use cases. Then the other very interesting part about Redis is the availability and scalability model. Redis architecture is based on the primary and uh, the replica model. You can actually update any of your engines without any downtime and also because of the cluster mode. I'll go into a little bit more details there. You can scale in and out your clusters without changing your clients, without any proxies, and without any downtime. The other powerful aspect of Redis is the number of commands it supports. And also, one other key feature that you want to think about is all the different eviction policies that Redis supports. Last, uh, the whole snapshotting feature of Redis helps you restore data. This is in memory, it's not persistent. But the way you configure your snapshots, you can actually restore your data. You can use that data both during disaster recovery and also seeding your caches. Another popular uh, in memory key value pair uh, engine is Memcached. Memcached is actually much constrained with respect to the amount of data types it supports and the number of commands it supports. Like Redis, it's in memory, it's very fast, it's open source, well established. But the, the, I'll walk through some of the constraints here. The thing I like about uh, Memcached is about the multi-threadedness and also the slab allocator is how they allocate the memory. Because of the way they allocate memory when you actually use one of these data types, the, the very optimal use of memory, and it avoids fragmentation. So the way the memory allocation is done in uh, Memcached is very interesting. Just to compare side by side, uh, both Redis and Memcached are in-memory databases, very fast. The data models that we use are key value pair. But the, we can put them in front of all types of relational, non-relational databases, storage databases for caching and other use cases. Like we talked about earlier, the data structure type that's supported in Memcached is limited. The commands that are supported in Memcached are limited. 
The high availability and failover is not existent in MemcacheD. In Redis, like because of the primary and replica architecture inside Redis, you get that there. The other one we talked about briefly was the eviction policies. The eviction policies in memcached are limited. So when would you use memcache versus Redis, right? In general, we are using a lot more, we are seeing a lot more adoption of Redis. We've seen memcached where your existing clients are using memcached. You're extremely performance cost sensitive, and maybe, I don't want to say this, but maybe availability is not that critical, but uh, the performance and cost is more important for you, and you don't want to change your existing clients that are using memcache. So, and the, the memory part, the fragmentation part is what is better in memcached. So, but in general, scaling, availability, programmable data structures available is much better in Redis. Just to uh, show that because of all the deep capabilities inside Redis, Redis is the number one in-memory database, both from uh, dbengines.com and uh, Stack Overflow. The developers rank Redis as a top in-memory data store year in, year out. Within the broader database category also, usually Redis shows up in the top 10 databases. As the real-time application started scaling, and a lot more of our customers started using these uh, Redis and in-memory databases, we started consistently hearing about how it was becoming hard for them to manage the full stack, right? What do you mean by manage a full stack? Especially around patching, upgrading the engines, keeping your encryption policies up to date, Dealing with spiky traffic, how do you scale and scale out without any disruption to your traffic? So that's when, hearing the pain of our customers, we launched Elasticash. Elasticash was launched around 2013. Primary tenants, when we looked at launching Elasticash, were we want to be 100% compatible with the open source, both for the Redis and Memcached. Extremely performant. What do I mean by that? We want to optimize the instances that you run on, both at the OS level, the driver level, and the engine level, to get the best cost performance that you can get out of that Redis engine. Then security, key tenant for us, top priority for us. How do we make your, your clusters enterprise ready, create all the security features that you need? Availability we talked about. We heard a lot of customers talking to us about how do we give them RDS-like auto failover, multi-AZ capabilities where your clusters are AZ resilient. Then we'll talk about how do we easily scale these clusters. So this is exactly what we launched Elasticash for. So let me go into internals of two of the things. I want to actually walk you through the details of how did we get these extreme performance in Elasticache. So generally, what, does, what impacts your performance on your cluster, right? Generally, if it's your network bound, the, th the network bandwidth that available on the instance is one thing that, that the performance is impacted on. Second is the server hardware that you run on, what instance type that you're running on. Third is the OS layers, just the, both, the, both the base OS and the hypervisor on top of it. And any optimizations that we can do inside the core Redis engine is what breaks open the performance for your clusters. So we launched uh, R5 and M5 instances last year. So our R5, M5 instances are dedicated hardware. What is interesting on these instances is the very light hypervisor that we launched on these instances. These hypervisors, the way they are implemented, sometimes it's, there's no difference. It looks like you're running on a bare metal. So what we did is we actually looked at, looked at this thin hypervisor. We looked at the network drivers and the OS layers and optimized our Elasticache code to run on M5s and R5s. By doing so, compared to the 
traditional R4 instances, for example, we were able to get to 144% more transactions per second. Because of the optimizations that we did on the network driver, we were able to reduce the latency by 23%. In some cases, we got to like 350 microseconds of latency. And when compared to vanilla R5, we were able to optimize your TPS by 30%. Similar thing happened for our M5 instances. Compared to M4, you get about 45% better TPS with an M5 instance. So this chart is just showing the differentiation between a vanilla instance optimized with the hypervisor, optimized even more at the network layer to get you much better performance on the, on the elastic hash. So we didn't stop there. We started looking deeper. Right? We were talking about, let me walk through how Redis works and why Redis is able to get this low latency and high throughput, right? Like, like we talked about earlier, Redis is very, very simple. It's a very, it's a single threaded applications, no race conditions, no synchronization needed. Very simple code, very easy to extend it. I can add functionality very, very easily. Uh, we'll go through the sharding architecture in deeper, but the overall, method or architecture that Redis believes in is share nothing architecture. Each of these shards get a subset of data, hence they're not sharing anything. That improves cache coherency. So how is it actually getting executed at the compute or the CPU level? Basically, your command execution happens in a single thread. When you're doing an I.O., you're like reading or writing from a socket interface the I.O. task gets sequenced behind uh, the, the command execution code. As the number of clients increase, each of these I.O. threads are getting op uh, serialized behind the command execution task. You can see, soon keeps building up. When we started profiling under high contention, especially when you're doing a lot of I.O., we figured that 70% of the time is spent in the socket layer waiting for the I.O. What, what happens because of that? The actual time the CPU has to execute a command goes down. You're pretty much sitting there waiting for the I.O. to finish. So, and this kind of becomes worse as the number of clients increase. This is where we said, what if we actually move the I.O. thread out of the main thread, run it as its own dedicated thread, and I can use my spare CPUs. A lot of the higher end uh, instances that we support have a lot more compute power. Why am I idling those CPUs? Because I just have a single threaded application. So we move the IO, th IO out. Just one thing I want to highlight is, if you have a single client, maybe this is not a good model because by moving the IO out, you'll create context which is unnecessarily. But as the number of IOs increase, number of clients increase, moving the IO thread out to a dedicated thread does magic. This is exactly what we did. This is what we call enhanced IO. The cool part about that is we did that without leaving the main Redis architecture as single threaded, very minimal changes to the Redis core, but you're able to use all the idle CPUs and the computers use much better. This actually has a big impact, not only on your throughput, on your latency also. With IO enhancements, just to give you some of our benchmarking, with 100 clients, we saw 56% better throughput. If we make the contention even higher and go to 800 clients, we saw up to 83% increase in throughput, and we saw latency come down by 47%. So all these results are published on our blog. So just to summarize, both with the introduction of the M5, R5 instances that had the thin hypervisor, and also the IO changes or the IO enhancements that we did, we were able to get 4x the throughput. So I'll walk through some of our customer use cases, how they're leveraging this throughput. Think of how you can right-size your clusters, how you can improve your TPS by using these IO enhancements. 
let's look at the other angle of uh, other angle of your workload characteristics scalability right with the with all the scalability changes that we've done we're actually able to scale up to 170 terabytes in our in our clusters Again, what are the different dimensions that you want to scale on? Generally, as your workload increases, your memory needs increase. You want to scale on memory. Sometimes you're throughput bound. You're doing a lot of compute, hence you want to scale on throughput. In some applications, maybe it's more write intense, hence you want to scale on write. In other cases, is read. So to achieve each of these, you do it in a different way. Generally, memory, throughput, and writes you want to scale by using shards. I'll walk through what I mean by shards. And reads, you want to scale with replicas. Let's walk through the different Redis topologies and how and what topology you want to use for each of these scale dimensions. Redis supports two modes. One I call cluster mode enabled. The other one called cluster mode disabled. In cluster mode disabled, you generally have one cluster. All your data resides in that cluster. You have a primary node, and you have multiple replicas. Basically, the only option to scale inside a cluster mode disabled clusters is vertical scaling. What I mean by vertical scaling is you go to bigger instance types, where you get more memory and more TPS. The more interesting use case is the cluster mode enabled clusters. Cluster mode enabled clusters give you both horizontal and vertical scale. Let's dig into what the cluster mode architecture looks like. The cluster mode architecture is basically you shard your, you scale by sharding your data horizontally. So in a cluster mode, you can support both cluster mode enabled clusters. You can support both vertical scale and horizontal scale. What happens in a horizontal scale? Let me walk through each of these fundamental blocks. A shard, look at it as a part of data of your cluster, has primary, multiple secondaries. You want to, sh you want to distribute your data across these shards, and usually your 16K uh, slots are distributed evenly across these shards. Each of the shard has unique data, and each shards have slots that are unique. As your data grows, you can horizontally scale. The cluster bus is how all these shards talk to each other. All the failover mechanisms, scaling, rebalancing of the shards, everything is taken care of by the cluster bus. Currently, we have a limit of 250 nodes in a cluster, but we're working on improving that. I'll talk to you guys more about that later. Let's walk through how you shard as your data grows. Like I mentioned before, shard has a subset of data. Each shard is unique, and Redis takes care of resharding and redistributing your slots when new slots get added. Go back one second. OK, as the, as the data grows, you've added new shards. Unlike the open source Redis, in ElastiCache, your data in a shard is atomic. What I mean by that is, in a given slot in open source Redis, the data gets distributed across multiple shards. We avoid that in ElastiCache. Your slot is always only on one shard. So your application can go to just that shard to get the data. And there's no changes on the client side. There's no need for a proxy layer that adds additional latency. Elastic Cache takes care of that for you. As soon as these new shards are added, you redistribute the salts. All the rebalancing happens. No downtime for your applications. We've done a lot of optimizations this year where during vertical scaling, horizontal scaling, no downtime even for writes. Oh, sorry, I'm going to work through one more. Yeah, similar thing, as your data shrinks, you can do automatically downsize. And during the downside also, Elastic Cache takes care of resharding. 
no downtime for your application for scale in, op uh, scale in operations also. Now that we've looked at what real-time applications are, why you want to use Elastic Cash for some of your real-time applications, how we've improved the performance, how we made your availability better and scalability better with Elastic Cash, let's look at some use cases on how our customers are using Elastic Cash. Obvious use case, caching. A lot of our customers use Elastic Cash for caching. Basically, in front of your relational databases, non-relational databases, S3, Redshift, you want to have faster access to your most frequently accessed data, and you want to take away workloads from your more expensive databases. Elastic Cache is an ideal choice for implementing a highly available, distributed, low latency, very high th throughput caching layer. I mean, the caching use cases can be as simple as query caching. You can cache your persistent sessions. You can cache a full, full web page if you want. Because of the depth of data structures that Redis supports, uh, we're seeing a lot more use cases beyond caching, right? One such use case is a session store, especially as the clusters, as your applications are becoming more secure, authentication, storing of authentication keys is a very good example. Some of your ephemeral connections, sessions that you have, because of the eviction policies and the TTL policies that Redis supports, Redis becomes a very good choice for storing your session keys. So we're seeing a lot more of just use cases of people using Elastic Cache for storing their session keys. Another big example is because of how quickly Redis can ingest data, process it, modify it. Another good use case is real-time streaming analytics. You're seeing a lot of our customers placing Elastic Cache uh, next to a Kinesis or a Kafka stream. For, as, again, the data structures it supports is what it uh, helps, and also the latency being sub-milliseconds, microseconds is very ideal choice for your real-time analysis kind of applications. Geospatial, I mean, Redis fits right into this geospatial, right? We will talk, Henry can talk more about how they use the deep, deep data structures inside Redis for their ride sharing. A Couple of our big customers, Grab, Lyft, all these guys use the geospatial geolocation coordinate data structures available inside Regis. It's very ideal to pick or search, sort based on location. Uh, typical application, ride sharing, dating, social media, gaming, e-commerce. Leaderboards, I think 90% of leaderboards use, uh, Eli use Redis. Again, the data structure depth, especially sorted sets, rank lists is what enables, enables b makes Redis ideal choice for leaderboard applications. Last, uh, chatting and messaging. There's deep data structures, especially with the introduction of streams and PubSub. I'm hearing a lot more customers implementing their PubSub architectures using Redis, right? Both because of the low latency the throughput of millions of, uh, millions of keys that they can support. I'm seeing a lot more cases, uh, people starting to use Redis for their implementing their PubSub kind of applications. Examples, chat rooms, messaging, a lot of microservices that want to exchange messages across. I'm seeing a lot of uh, Redis use cases in the messaging use cases. We looked at a broad spectrum. I want to give like specific examples of some of our big customers that are using uh, Redis, right? Let's start with Expedia. Expedia uses uh, Elastic Cache for the ca caching layer. Same, everybody looking for low latency, high throughput, cost. Where they inserted Elastic Cache is there in A-B testing. Uh, they think like their scale is around 200 million messages per day really working well for them. Grab, Lyft will go into a lot more details. Let me talk about the other ride-hailing service that is running on Elastic Cash. 
Grab is one of the leading ride hailing services in uh, Southeast Asia. They actually cater up to 4 million bookings per day. Uh, they use Elastic Cash again for the caching layer because they need a lot of real time compute. They, they told us that they're actually estimate like 30 to 40% manpower saving with AWS using Elastic Cash. Fortnite, who doesn't know Fortnite? So Epic Games is one of our big users. Here it's a real, real good story I wanna share with you guys. We talked about the optimizations that we did on M5 and R5. During the launch of Fortnite, uh, they were looking at scaling their clusters because the, the number of, number of uh, people who are gonna log in at that concurrent sessions was gonna be very high for them. Epic Games uses Elastic Cash for storing their session data. So just by moving to R5, M5, they didn't have to add any more nodes. Not only they didn't add any nodes, they actually brought, up, brought down their CPU usage by two thirds. So it's a really good story on how customers are able to use some of these optimizations and right size their clusters. The last example, uh, GE. GE uses it for an internal Predix platform that is used by their developers to build their microservices. Again, this platform, they wanted to keep uh, it completely stateless. They use Elastic Cash to show the session state. These are like few examples of our customers. I just wanted to highlight the varied nature and the different types of use cases our customers are using Elastic Cash for. With this, let me hand it over to Henry. Henry will walk us through their migration, their journey from self-managed to Elastic Cash, what they learned from it, and what, they, uh, what, they, what he can share with you all. Thank you, Pratibha. As many of you know, Leaf is one of the major ride-sharing platforms serving many millions of users in North America. Last year, 2018, we completed the first billion rides on our platforms within six years of operations. So, one of the core challenges for a ride share service is keep track of accurate location of users, both drivers and passengers. It is critical for a good user experience. It allows us to do good matchings and also have efficient pickups. In order to do this, our apps update the locations every five seconds. Then these location events get processed through our location ingestion pipeline and stored in our backend stored. I believe we also embrace the microservice architecture and all services that are trying to use the locations data would go through the location service. Initially, we only have a handful of services that make use of this data. But as Leaf grows, the number of services expand significantly, let's say. Now we have more than 50 services accessing location data through location service. The amount of throughput during peak time also increased dramatically to our data store. It grew from six million requests per second to about 45 million requests per second. In order to continue to provide good user experience, we also need to keep the, low la uh, the latency very low. So what is the appropriate data store? And since you're in this session, you probably guessed it, it is Redis. Redis is used at live for locations for its low latency, high throughput in memory characteristics. So before we go into what our locations clusters looks like, I want to walk you through how Leaf's Redis infrastructure evolved over time. Like many companies, we started using Toon Proxy to shard the Redis request to a cluster of independent Redis nodes. This is a great solution for the data plane because it's fast, it's stable, and it's especially good for Python services where you have a lot of Python workers on each machine, and all these local connections can be pipelined into a few shared connections to the upstream Redis, improving, improving throughputs. However, as many of you already know, Twin Proxy 
project is unmaintained, and it, its con control plane consists of static configuration file on each machine that is a really pain uh, to update. So there has to be something better, right? Well, Envoy is an open source project coming from Leaf. It is a sidecar proxy that is the foundations of Leaf's service mesh architecture. All of Leaf's HTTP traffic are proxy through Envoy. Naturally, we expanded Envoy to also support the Redis protocol. So this gives us the same performance data planes and abstractions for the applications, but now it has a much more dynamic control plane. Envoy is designed to dynamically update its configurations without dropping the client connections. Another benefit of integrating this into Envoy and as part of our service mesh is we get consistent metrics, client-side metrics, not server-side metrics. And this allows the infra team to build standardized dashboards and alerts for all of our services, regardless of what language they use to write those service in. In a design like this, the sharding decision is essentially distributed to independent Envoy processes with no coordination with each other. And there is also no coordination among the Redis nodes. This maximizes availability, but it actually offers little in terms of consistency. From 2018 onwards, the number of Redis clusters used at Leaf double to 130 clusters. As the number of services used Redis increase, the requirements for different consistency trade-off and different scale requirements also changes. We need something a little bit more flexible than that. And also, another thing that increases uh, as the Redis cluster and number of Redis nodes increase is number of alerts that get triggered. And you know what developers like more than alerts that just come out of the box and they don't have to write? is alerts that doesn't get triggered, which leads us to our current setup. So again, we extended Envoy to support the open source Redis cluster protocol. And we build our infrastructure on top of Elastic Cache. In this setup, both the cluster memberships and sharding decisions are done within Elastic Cache. Whenever the Envoy process has an outdated topology, it actually works because Redis would redirect that request to the correct node, hence reducing any error. On top of that, Elastic Cache also automatically detects failures and fail over to the replicas. One of the key advantages that we have now that we have replicas is now we can scale the read and the write independently by either adding more shards or adding more replicas, which is really exciting for me personally because this really helps us solve the hot shard issues and hotkey issues with location service. The only downside if I want to nitpick is without running the cluster ourselves, we no longer can run chaos monkey process killing nodes. But I would argue that it is actually better to implement full injections into the proxy rather than killing one node at a time. So, with all that said, this is what our location service looks like. You can see that we're using multiple clusters to store different type of data and also for different type of usages. On the left, we have locations geo, where we store the user ID in an area as a sorted set with the geo hash as the key. 
This is how we quickly retrieve the list of users within an area. The score is the timed, allowing us to expire all user out of the set. On the right, the same location data for each user is actually replicated to three clusters. Locations high is used for our critical service, and locations mean and low are used for our T1 and T2 services. This allows us to protect our critical code path from, say, a buggy experimental feature that exhausts all of our Redis throughputs by accident, of course. And it also allows us to optimize each cluster for the different access patterns. And you, note, you can notice that they have different number of replicas. For our use cases, most of the clusters are actually CPU bound. That's why we pick M5 large for the best trade-off between CPU, memory, and throughput for this use case. Remember earlier we talked about we had more than 100 Redis clusters. How do we try to in, even try to migrate this with a small engineering team of two engineers? Well, the way to do that is to try to do the migration with no code change. Lyft is living in a polyglot world. We have a lot of services implemented in different languages. Python, Go, Java, Scala, even c -sharp. So how do we do this migration without code change? As you can see, this is actually a pretty typical setup on what it looks like when we are proxying Redis through Envoy. The application will connect to a local Envoy process on port 6379. And so we first would provision a new cluster, and we update the Envoy configuration to instruct it to start shadowing traffic to uh, both clusters. Uh, asynchronously to the shadow cluster. And as we ramp up the percentage of shadow traffic, we use this opportunity to optimize the Elastic Cache configurations. We use this to figure out how many shards we need, how many replicas per shard by looking carefully at our metrics. And this is why during this phase, we actually would send both the read and write traffic to the shadow cluster as well. For teams that are not familiar with Elastic Cache, we actually use this opportunity to perform some operational readiness exercise, making sure the team knows where to find alerts, where to find dashboards, and how to perform scale, scaling operations, or even perform failover drills. Once we are satisfied with operational readiness and the performance readiness for the new cluster, we want to ensure the data is consistent across both clusters. To do this, we update Envoy to open a separate port that only talks to the new cluster. And then we'd run a simple validation script to compare all the values across these two. This also allows us to catch things like keys that are never updated or things that we have forgot that even exist. Trust me, those things happen. And then once we are satisfied the data correctness, we simply swap the clusters. During this swapping process, we continue to do right to both. And the reason we do that is a, it allows us to easily fall back should, the, should we find some problems with the new cluster, but also we want to make sure throughout this process the writes are actually captured in both so that we always serve the correct data. And sometimes some servers involve updating multiple ASGs, so it might take a little bit of time. And once everything's swapped over, next thing is easy. You simply update the configurations 
to stop all traffic to the old cluster and deprovision it. And that will have it. Uh, live migrations without changing the application code whatsoever. Through this journey, we have a lot of learnings. Across our 130 clusters, we saw a very significant drop in the number of alerts that triggered. We used to have a bit more than 100 pages per month, but now it dropped to less than one. We are also able, one of the things we really care about is what happens if an incident do happen, say a node fail, uh, the hardware could fail, or that we found certain shards are running a little bit too hot, we want to add a new replica. We found that Elastic Cache actually performed really well. It was able to fail over and have the a new node uh, ready in about five minutes, same as adding a new replica. Of course, uh, scaling out or rebalancing the entire shard takes a little bit longer, but this is highly workload dependent. It depends on how much data you have on each of your nodes and how much data you have in your clusters. Another thing that we're really impressed by is the performance optimization that the Elastic Cache team was able to do. Among our four clusters, the largest ones, we were able to observe 36 million requests per second on a single cluster, while only using 48% CPU, giving us a lot of headroom to grow. The other thing is also the P99 latency. Uh, we observe that to be about 0 0.5 milliseconds in our workload. This is measured on the client side, so this is after all the networks and things like that. And I want to stress that this is, uh, you should do, always do your own measurements because it is highly workload dependent. It depends on the type of commands you use, the type of data structure you use, and also your data size. And by, em um, by embracing the service mesh architecture, we were able to get around the limitations on different languages and with implementing a rich feature set into this mesh, we are able to migrate this. But what I'm really excited about is that we get all of this reliability and performance out of the box from day one. We're able to migrate some of our cr most critical services and none of our migration process have caused any production outages. And we're excited to see what else is ahead of us. Uh, from Elastic Cash. Thank, Thank you. you, Henry. Thanks for sharing your journey. Let's look at uh, what's new in 2019. I think the Elastic Cash team has been pretty busy. Uh, most of these are most requested features by our customers. Let me walk you through some of these features. Let's start out with we consistently kept hearing from our customers that they still have some of their clusters either in EC2 native or in on-prem, they're not able to migrate because they cannot take downtime. We've launched a self-migration, online migration earlier, uh, earlier this quarter. With the online migration tool, you can migrate your cluster mode disabled clusters from EC2 native into Elastic Hash. You can also migrate your on-prem, uh, but that's more of a white glove migration. If you have on-prem use cases, please reach out to us. The second one is the self-serve maintenance updates. As, your, uh, as we update the engines or we update patches related to your clusters, now you can do it in a self-serve way at your convenience and monitor it live. So we will send you emails, we will post to your personal health dashboards when these updates are available, and you can configure when you want to pick up these updates. We went in length about the scalability of Elastic Cash. We've done a lot of improvements this year in the scale up, scale down. Let me walk through both cluster mode disabled and cluster mode enabled scaling enhancements that we've done. 
In cluster mode, enabled clusters. Now you can actually vertically scale your nodes. In cluster mode, disabled clusters, you can actually scale down. Scale down was not supported earlier. I think I kind of mentioned it earlier. During all these planned operations, whether they are scaling up, scaling down, scaling in, scaling out, replacing your nodes, you have zero downtime even for your writes. The only downtime you have, maybe for around 20 seconds or so, is for unplanned events. So even that, we are working on optimizing the downtime for unplanned events. Security, key tenant for us, high priority. We've done a lot of interesting work to make Elasticash enterprise ready. Rename command, simple but powerful. All this rename command does is lets you rename your Redis commands. Why is that important for security, right? So some of these commands are very disruptive. You don't want people to just use these cause disruption to your clusters. You can rename so that you can avoid any unintentional actions on your clusters. Elastic Cache, day one, we were very deep about security. Your clients, your servers are inside the VPC. You get the whole VPC boundary for security. You get encryption at rest, encryption at transit. We went beyond. Our customers are asking us to bring their own keys. Today, Elastic Cache actually allows you to bring your own keys for encryption, upload them into KMS, and use that for your encryption. Auth token rotation. Redis supports auth tokens, but you can set the password. You can never change it. So again, a customer pain. We solved it this year. You can actually rotate your tokens as often as you want. The other key tenant that I talked about, we want to be completely OS open source compatible, both for our memcached and for Redis. And one of the key pain points our customers are talking about is the version currency, right? How quickly we can launch a new released version in the open source. We've actually released the last version, took us just six weeks from it was released on open source to get into Elastic Cache. So this year we launched 503, 504, 505, and Memcache 1516. We talked about in-depth internal workings on what we did with IO enhancements. Uh, the other thing, pretty exciting, we've launched T3. T3 is for your low-end workloads, combustible, uh, burstable platform, sorry. Uh, so T2s, uh, T3s are actually close to 400% better TPS compared to uh, T3, uh, T2s. So we recommend uh, T3s for your non-production workloads, test and development kind of environments. Just wanted to give a sneak peek into what we are thinking of in 2020, right? Outposts, I'm sure you've heard a lot about outposts at reInvent. Outposts for us is like computed edge. Uh, again, customers who are very latency sensitive, who have certain compliance requirements to have compute within their data centers, they've reached out to us on wanting Elastic Cache within that environment. So Elastic Cache will be supported on Outposts pretty soon. Redis 6.0, staying with being current. Redis 6.0 has a lot of features, especially in the uh, security area around ACL support, REST v3. They're working on interesting ideas around client-side caching. So we started looking at 6.0 already, and we will be current as soon as 6.0 is released. Building up on the security features, one of the things we contributed back to 6.0 is a TLS implementation. So what we're going to do is leverage the ACL capabilities into 6.0 and build role-based access control. You will be able to use uh, AWS identity and access management just like you use for rest of your AWS resources to manage your Elastic Cache resources also. Redis logs, again, a key asked feature. We're working on it, we'll get it out soon. Building on the instance type and the performance optimizations that we do, uh, Andy announced a new ARM instance that we are gonna support, ARM generation two. 
Uh, we're actually qualifying Elasticash on the next generation. We're seeing very good results both on Redis and Memcached. It'll be yet another instance types that you can use for better cost performance for running your Elasticash clusters. Last but not the least, as your workloads are growing, we've heard from a lot of customers they all want to move to cluster mode enabled clusters, and they want to have more than 250 nodes in their clusters. 250 is the limit today. We are working on getting it to 500. Lyft, for example, is ready to use 500 soon, a bunch of other customers. So we are trying to get to beyond 500 to 1,000 next year. So high level, this is what we are thinking of next year. So just I want to leave you guys with a couple of other sessions that we have for Elasticash uh, throughout this week. I've given you a peek into some of our features, but there is a complete breakout session later today and repeated tomorrow on what's new. We have a detailed breakout session on how our live migration works and how customers are leveraging live migration without any downtime. I kind of talked about some of the use cases our customers are using Elasticash for, and use cases beyond caching. There are a lot of interesting workshops that will take you through each of those use cases. Some of our senior engineers and principals are here and conducting these workshops, small uh, sessions with a lot of customer interaction. And there is a workshop, if you're new to Elasticash and work, get, want to get started with Elasticash, there's a workshop where our uh, essays can walk you through how you can get started for Elasticash within uh, 60 minutes. Okay, thank you. Hopefully you got a brief overview of what we've been doing, uh, how we are taking care of our customer us. Uh, we can take any questions now. Uh, kindly, if you can go to the mic.